You shall not steal is the eighth commandment. It is also the eighth part in the series that we have on the Ten Commandments according to Jesus. Now, as we are talking about this, uh, there's, you're wondering, well, this is going to be a pretty simple teaching. Just don't steal. Well, I'm going to go into in the full depths of this in the heart that God wanted us to have when he gave this command. This is an easy one to just simply blindly obey. But God wants us to think deeper about possessions. He wants us to think deeper about greed and the things that drive people to steal in the first place. You see, this is kind of what this whole series is about, is that God wrote the Ten Commandments on stone to reflect the hardness of the Israelites' hearts, where God and Jesus all throughout the Bible have said that God has longed to write his laws on our hearts so that they don't have to be marked and etched on stone, that we should want to do the things that are right. And the fact that we have to write them down testifies that we have a bent that is away from God. So thanks be to God, he has written them down for us so that we can learn them and impress them upon our hearts and pray that he can lead us into his law of love and grace. And so we want to understand the full uh, ramifications, all aspects of what does it mean to do not steal. And a couple forms that we're going to take here today is what does it mean to don't steal from somebody else? And what does it mean to don't steal from God? Because you know what? We do rob God. We will be explaining that a little bit later. But first, ultimately, we should be thinking that someone else's possession is theirs. And we have to uh, think of the same light that Jesus taught, saying, what you would have people do to you, you should do it to others. So, for example, if you lost $1,000 and somebody else found it, uh, you would hope that they would have an ethic to say, you know what, I should return this to the owner. I shouldn't just say finders keepers because this is going to be very meaningful to somebody else. So, do not steal applies for a lot more than just don't take something that isn't yours. And ultimately, that needs to go into our head saying, if it isn't ours, then it isn't ours. That sounds simple, but it has actually quite a bit of a ramification to that. You know, there's even, I'm going to get you to do some homework. Even when the laws were being written that we see in Leviticus and Deuteronomy, that if a cow was to be lost uh, and wander away, that the finder of that should try to seek its original owner, not just say finders keepers. And so with that, look up, put in the comment section when you can find it, what scripture that is so the rest of us uh, can enjoy it with you. So I'm going to do a few things like that of asking questions and getting you to fill them in the comment section as we interact together as a church near and far. And uh, so as we continue on that, again, to do not steal also means to make sure that whoever has something, that it's theirs and we get it back to them because that's the honorable thing to do. So again, if it's not yours, don't take it. Uh, we can borrow it with permission, uh, but we do not take something without someone's uh, permission. What is interesting is by the fact that God says, do not steal, tells us that he believes in personal property rights. Uh, otherwise, it wouldn't be stealing. And, uh, and so with that, we need to understand that God allows people to have possessions. And we need to respect that, and they need to respect that of ours. But we also learn from Jesus in Matthew 6 that we don't uh, idolize our possessions. And he says, you know, God knows you need them, but seek first the kingdom and his righteousness, and then all this other stuff will be given to you. Hold it loosely because moth and rust destroy. Jesus taught us to put our treasures in heaven in Matthew chapter 6. So I wanted to encourage you to read those Beatitudes, Matthew 5, Matthew 6, and we'll see the ethic that Jesus is really getting behind us. He's preaching in those couple chapters uh, what it's like to have a heart that responds to these Ten Commandments. That's why Jesus often said, you heard it was said this, and he quotes an Old Testament uh, law. He goes, but I tell you this, not overturning it, but fulfilling it fleshing it out to see its full purpose so that we can see that we need to make sure that we possess God first, that the treasures that we should want are the ones that are in heaven, uh, not here on the earth, where moth and rust destroy and thieves come in and steal. Another reason why we shouldn't steal is because Jesus identifies Satan as uh, a great stealer, like he is a thief, and uh, he comes only to uh, kill, steal, and destroy. And we don't want to have any part in being like Satan, so we need to resist the urge to take something that is not ours. There are many ways that we can steal from other people that's more than just possessions. We can steal people's time. You know, murder is actually stealing of somebody's life uh, and taking it away from them. And so that's why, again, why murder was last week's, uh, or two weeks ago. But we want to be encouraged to know that we don't want to steal somebody's time. We know that time is precious. How can we bless people and how can we invite people or ask people for their time versus to just go and to take it? You know, we also learned a couple of weeks ago that uh, adultery is against God's law. Why? Because then you're stealing somebody else's spouse. So stealing actually uh, relates to almost all of the uh, commandments. Even like, so to honor your mother and father, don't steal the life from them and just take it and use it for something else. We need to repay our parents in some respect because that they had us at a great high cost. 
We also learn in the New Testament that we can even uh, steal people of their honor and glory. We need to make sure that if, uh, if we owe a debt to somebody, whether that debt is by respect, by honor, or by money, that we repay it, that we do not steal or take advantage of others. Kids are learning in school uh, that you don't plagiarize. That means to steal somebody else's work and to uh, position it as if it was your own. And why research papers, even though they use other people's information, their information is always in part of that essay in the footnotes to let everybody know where they got that information so they give credit where credit is due. And why? Because stealing hurts other people and it robs them of other things. And we need to make sure that somebody owns something that is indeed theirs and they have full rights and use over it that God gave them, not us, not government, not anybody, but God himself. And so because we care about each other, even those who are not believers, that we want to make sure that everybody is honored, that we want people to be blessed and to be prosperous. That's another reason why God's given us these things, is God is very generous. He's given us the land. And as we, as we look towards, we're going to go into the Old Testament as it talks to uh, them taking over the promised land. God gave them a land with wells they did not uh, dig and with cities they did not build. And so God asked them to be generous for he is generous. And so in the same way, greed, Satan is greedy. We should not be greedy. So when we talk about robbing and stealing, we're taking things that belong to other people. And there's some things that might be in our possession that are not ours. A case, for example, is the prophet Malachi in Malachi chapter 3 said that the people were robbing God by not giving the tithes and the offerings as they were so commanded. So it needs to be understood that with God being so generous, he wants us to prosper, but he also wants to make sure that we are fair with the prosperity that we receive, that we do not hoard it. As again, as I've already told you, that God wants us to store treasure in heaven. Uh, we do that by being generous to God and to others, and he wants us to make sure that we give to people what is theirs. And ultimately, so God asks of his people saying, I have given you the earth, I've given you lots of good things, I, and I, I have a portion to it that to, for you to continue in prosperity and to grow in your faith, I'm going to appoint Levites to be priests. So one tribe out of 12 is going to be uh, not given a land apportionment, which means the other 11 tribes, you guys need to tithe. That means one-tenth at the soon as you have it. When you're shearing sheep, you take the first 10% and go give it to the Levites. You're picking apples, you go give the first 10%, not the last 10%, and not the worst 10%, the first 10% goes towards the Levites because they don't have a ways of making uh, money. You guys are gonna do the work, they're going to be your teachers, and this is kind of like why we pay taxes and then the government pays doctors, you know, so that they can look after us. In the same way, God thought that one in 11 families uh, should be a full-time position to help bring uh, a closeness to God, to help God and man uh, intermingle and to have God's work done here on the earth. So we learn in the New Testament, Jesus appointed 12 apostles, uh, very clearly uh, uh, comparing the new covenant with the old that was based on the 12 patriarchs. And uh, so I really want you to understand this, that God's work still needs to be done. Deuteronomy 14, 18, and 21 explain a little bit more about the tithe and about the Levites, and specifically saying that they were to be full-time workers in order to be able to get God's people closer to God and to teach what is right. So God thought one in 12 needed to be a teacher, a full-time, and he didn't even give them any land to do it, and he said to the others, you got to look after him. That's where the tithe came from. It actually originated with uh, Abraham giving a tenth of a plunder that he had done to uh, the, the priest and king Melchizedek. And you can read that back in Genesis. Tell me what chapter Genesis it is. So it was always understood by the patriarchs, even before Moses had it written down as law that God told him to, was that 10% was an acceptable offering to the Lord. And uh, so then this, with the Levites, it became enshrined in law. Now that, that was not an income tax. That was not a temple tax. That was not a tax to build the synagogues. That was not a tax to do anything other than to look after the Levites. And so technically the Levites wouldn't need the tithe because the tithe was collected on their behalf. They would just need to make sure it was distributed among them equally. And so that was the purpose of it. There was other property tax. There was conscription to war. There was uh, a temple tax that was separate. And then alms to the poor were seen as an extra. And so the average person, much of their salary would be taken up by taxes of other things. So some people think today because uh, the government looks after people through our taxes, that that means I don't need to tithe as much, but that was never the way the tithe worked anyway. We're also told by the Lord that he wanted us to tithe again to ourselves to save for the future, to save for uh, recreation, to save for times that we would have festivals honoring the Lord. And uh, you can read about that again in Deuteronomy chapter 14, that uh, there's a couple different tithes throughout the Old Testament. 
So what is interesting about that, too, is in this country, the government recognizes that the work the church does is not something that they could afford ever to do the amount of work that we do. And so we end up with a tax credit. The government also realizes, with good measure, that when people save for the future, it's less of a burden on the government systems uh, going into the future. And uh, so what do they do? Well, for every 10 we make, if we go by the Bible's minimum standards in the Old Testament, I'll explain the new in a second, when we earn every $10 we earn, we give one to God and we save one for a rainy day. What is interesting is both of those two are 50% tax deductible if you are a taxpayer. So that means that tax season, you're going to get one back. So even after tax season is over, if you've tithed to the Lord and you've saved 10%, you still have, uh, you get eight, then you get a ninth back and one still saved. This is why people in this country, when they tithe and when they save, they notice there's no difference in their budget. I need to tell you that because this is really important to help you to get ahead in life and to make sure the gospel that came to us goes out from us. Now, we're talking about money at church, and I don't like talking about money at church because I know it makes people squirm. But I want to encourage you, um, if it's making you squirm, ask yourself why. Why would we not want to be generous to God? I could not imagine going into heaven, screaming at the top of my lungs, praising God in heaven, yes, and everything you gave me, I spent it all on me. Uh, I could not imagine saying that going to heaven. And uh, we should rejoice to be one, to be a generous and kind like Jesus, and to know that, hey, if I give something uh, to the Lord, I know that God knows how to look after me. So it can often be a trust issue. You know what? If you're not a believer, please don't give. If you're not a cheerful giver, don't give. This is an act of Christian worship that we get to be a part of. And, uh, and so I want to encourage you again to, to even change the way you view money. And because this is something that has a deep grip on a lot of people. Please don't go to heaven. This is my encouragement to you. Please don't go to heaven having spent it all on yourself. Let us be a generous people. Let us help those who are in need. Get this ministry out to the world. And because of lack of tithes, there have been a lack of pastors across North America uh, in churches. And because of that, we see a direct uh, correlation to church attendance uh, and of people coming to faith. So it, it, there is a connection between the growth of the gospel, our service, we call it our time, talent, and treasure. And so we see that we want to give a minimum of 10% to the Lord. And there'll be no New Testament scholar who says that if uh, some people will say, well, tithe is not in the New Testament, Jay, so why should I have to do that? I'm like, well, I do believe that it is. It talks about it in Hebrews. Uh, it talks about that when Jesus talks about it, that the 12 apostles and those that would come after them would be basically the replacement of the Levites doing God's work. And so with that, we learn in Ephesians chapter 4, uh, verses 10 onward, that God has called full-time people in his church, prophets, apostles, pastors, teachers, evangelists, to be full-time vocation people set aside to do the work uh, to train people for works of service. Not even necessarily to do it all themselves, but to train someone. So do you view coming to church as you're coming to college so you can be trained on how to live your family, how to love your wife or your husband, how to raise your children? Are you coming here to learn how to tell the gospel to your neighbor? Because that is what we should be understanding, that the church is an institution, yes, that trains people and that we use all of our gifts together to be a blessing on the world. So I do believe that the tithe is at least the minimum standard in the New Testament. Uh, in fact, if you were to argue, uh, the only way you could argue that the tithe does not exist in the New Testament is by saying that that's chump change. Because we see that, that um, as the tithes were given, that there was more that was given in offerings because there was tithes, which was the 10%, and then offerings, which was any additional generosity that you would have. And what we see is every time there was an offering that was made in the New Testament, it was made not about what, by what people make, it was made by what was the current need at hand. And, uh, and so we learned that. So, uh, for example, the government it did, uh, remember I told you they do some social services? Well, when the Christians got kicked out of the temple, they also got kicked out of the, basically the food stamp program. Uh, grain was given and bread and things like that to those who were poor. So if you identified as a Christian, you were cut off from that government funding and then you were susceptible to starvation, which is why it's remarkable that people like Barnabas and Acts, it's in the book of Acts early on, someone put in the comment section what chapter of Barnabas uh, uh, so he got named son of encouragement because he sold the field and he gave the proceeds, all of it, to the church because the need was so great. And that's why in Acts chapter 4, when it talks about the apostles sharing everything, it wasn't a communistic thing. It was making sure that nobody was without need and that if somebody needed it, everyone considered the possessions that they have is that God has given them this gift to be a revolving door of blessing, to be able to help those that are in need. And they took great pride in being able to have a possession that they could give 
away. And it wasn't about the amount and it wasn't about the percentage. It was about what is the requirement. And that's why it was so remarkable when it says that nobody was in need was because they had been kicked out of the system, and yet the Christians were able to come together as a ragtag group of people and to make sure that everybody had something and nobody went without. So again, I'll never teach people to give so they'll get, but that is a principle in Scripture. Uh, I don't want you to give so that God will give you more, because that's a kind of a, uh, a greedy way of going about it. We should have the heart of the apostles to just say, what do I have and how can I bless people with it? And then if God's going to see that, think about it. If you were God and you want to pour blessing down on the earth, who would you give the blessing to? The greedy person, the violent person, or the generous person? So God is looking to and fro for people to whom he can bless. Not just so that we can have lots of nice things, but so that we can be a blessing to others. So it's a matter of of trust, really. It's a matter of trust to see, like, have we been faithful with the resources that God has given us? We have learned in Malachi chapter 3, you can read that whole chapter to understand the context yourself, that we understand that God will withhold blessing from greedy people. And he even equated not tithing as robbing God. And, uh, and so with this, I pray that, that I don't care if a tithe is a penny or whatever. Like The whole point of this is that we have a generous heart after God's own heart, that we don't have the grip of money in our hearts and in our lives. Some people might then ask, okay, Jay, if we do tithes and offering, where should we give those to? Well, I think that you should, uh, wherever your team is, you need to sow into your team. You know, I don't think that the Toronto Maple Leafs, they're going to give uh, whatever funds that they get from ticket sales and give it to the Montreal Canadiens. I just don't think they're going to do that. Uh, mind you, I'm going to say other churches are not our uh, opponent, as those two teams are. So it makes common sense to give to where you are being trained and to what team you are a part of. And I encourage you to even uh, think of uh, leadership aspirations. We're praying for new leaders every day to rise up because there is a portion of this that comes out, knowing that we live in the land of plenty. And, uh, and typical pastors like here in our church make similar to school teachers. And so it's like, not this is all about money. I made more money working in construction, uh, managing the family business before I got into ministry so many years ago. It's not about the money. It is good though that we can look after our pastors here and uh, the tithe is what does that. Those who faithfully give, I gotta tell you, we have a lot of people that faithfully give. I don't know who gives what, but I know the totals that come in uh, uh, from the numbers point of view. And I'm just, I'm just so thankful that there are people, most people, in fact, in our church, as I understand it, um, are tithing. And so this is never to be a wag your finger at it. So I'm glad that it's in a time of peace like this or that we, we don't have a pressing need other than to continue to grow and get the gospel out to the world, but that we can rejoice in knowing that, you know what, we've got a lot of obedient uh, Christians here in this church family who want to make sure that the world is blessed through the gospel of Jesus Christ. And for that, I thank God for you. The Apostle Paul, he thanked the Philippians when they gave a gift that allowed him to stop temporarily making tents so that he could go back to preaching full-time, and all kinds of people came to faith. In fact, because of those efforts, the gospel came all the way from there down to us. And we can thank the Philippian church for being faithful with the land of plenty that they had, they were able to send out. You know, we have missions. We send out to our denominational partners a a, a handsome sum sum of funds that goes to help countries around the world who have never heard the gospel to get it. And that's all coming from right here. In fact, it's all coming from from you. Like when you give an offering, like it's literally going around the world. It's literally the gospel is going into our communities. And so we pray that we can be a church family wherever we are, near and far, that we can have a sphere of influence around us, that we are responding to all God's commands because he writes them on our heart, that we want to do it, we want to be a part of it. We can expect blessing when we are obedient. That's all throughout the entire uh, New Testament. But I don't want you to go after God because of what's in his hand. Go after God for what's in his heart, and then he'll give you what's in his hand. He promises that. We look forward to better days as uh, we end a pandemic and are moving forward into doing ministry more in person uh, and abroad, that we, we pray that the gospel is going to continue to go out there. We pray that we would have our heart not be troubled, that our heart not be, because this is an easy one to, to um, uh, offend us because we work hard for money and we think like to give it away can be, a, can be definitely a trust issue. And so I want to encourage you to start somewhere. I want to encourage you to, even if it's not to your local church, then be generous to someone somewhere else. I do think you should support your home team, but uh, I'd be more impressed if someone says, you know, I I tithe, but not to here. I go elsewhere. I'm like, well, that's fine. God will provide a way. He always has. We've had lean years and we've had plenty years and God has seen us through each time. So I pray that ultimately that you would understand when we say do not steal from God, as the eighth commandment is uh, in full view here. 
that we look at ways to be like him, to be generous. And we pray that he would look after every one of our needs. And we pray that we can be examples um, to others around us. Not that we let everybody know what we give uh, to be, to be uh, you know, esteemed by them, but I told you of how many people tithe that, you know, there's no big benefactors in this church giving hundreds of thousands of dollars. Uh, the average gifts are average folks that are, that are tithing. And as I mentioned back before, the Levites didn't need to tithe. Well, I want to encourage you that this Levite does. Uh, I could probably argue that the tithes are to help to pay for salaries. Um, but to be an example, I need to say that, that we've tithed every penny we've ever made. And that is not to boast, but to be accountable to you as a leader in this church uh, and to thank you for looking after me and my family, as I pray that I can spiritually uh, look after yours in the name of God and the peace that we have together by serving our Lord Jesus Christ together. I want you to know, too, those of you who might be watching and thinking, like, why would a person ever give away that kind of money? Uh, 10%, that seems crazy. And I want to encourage you. Our God is a really big God. Uh, and even if you're not ready to give, and again, if you're not doing it out of an act of worship, I don't want it in this place and our finance people do a great job, very accountable to the government and to the congregation on every dollar that is spent, that we want you to know that we take great uh, uh, strides to make sure that we are financially literate and honest. And ultimately we do this to protect the reputation of the church so that we can make sure that the reputation amongst those who have yet to believe doesn't get tarnished because we don't want the gospel ministry to get tarnished, which is simply this, that God made a perfect world, he handed it over to us. Humanity. Humanity botched it. He could have left us and let us just wear out and die in this mess that we have made, but he's offered to fix it through his son, and that will be in heaven forever. So the travails that we have in this world are only a reminder that we've broken God's perfect universe and that he has offered us grace and forgiveness through Jesus Christ, who died according to the scriptures, and on the third day was raised again, proving life over death, and that any who follow him, who trust in him for salvation, and decide to align our lives and follow him to make him the leader of our life, then he will lead us, not only now by the power of his Holy Spirit, not only will he bless us now by the power of his Holy Spirit, but he will also give us all things anew, fixed and prosperous in heaven. Thank you for tuning in. God bless you. Have a great day. We here at LifePoint would love to get connected with everybody who might be watching our broadcasts. And so if you are in and around the vicinity or you're watching from afar, we encourage you to get connected to us. The email here on the screen and the phone number can help us to get connected to you. You drop your information here. If you'd like to have a prayer request uh, put in, if you would like to get connected so you're on the email chain, uh, this is also a place where we can give to this email. I want to encourage you, those who are attending LifePoint, those who are Christians, that we can sow into the ministry here of LifePoint so that we can make sure that the, the gospel that came to us goes out from us. Now, we want to encourage people who have not believed in the Lord Jesus Christ yet. The, don't worry about giving. This is an act of Christian worship that we get to be a part of God's amazing gift of salvation by proclaiming it to the generations yet to come. And uh, if you'd like to join up with us, we would love to get connected with you and to see what else God can do in this town and beyond in the days and years ahead. So we down here in Dartmouth at Regal have partnered with you, for those that don't know, volunteering our time and efforts to see that uh, LifePoint gets strengthened and, uh, and is able to call a new pastor for your guys' next step in your future. So I encourage you to get involved and help us to make sure that this church becomes a strong church and a beacon of light for Jesus in this community and beyond.